Good morning, everyone. Welcome on today's episode of Chikahan with Tito Jo. Ano. So, um, if you want more of this, don't forget to like, share, and follow Anakbayan Europa for more updates, as well as to subscribe to uh, Tito Jo's channel of Maria Season. So, for today, as um, we are going to talk about um, the COVID-19 and its impact on youth education, because as you know, the socioeconomic condition worsened during this time of pandemic under Duterte's regime. And one of the affected sectors is the education. So, um, Today, we will discuss with Tito Jo on uh, the COVID-19 and its effect on the youth's education. Tito, are you ready? I'm happy to be uh, with you again, uh, uh, fellow activists and uh, uh, compatriots. Uh, uh, we are going to discuss uh, a, burning, a burning issue and uh, in, in its interrelation with other issues. And uh, uh, this makes our webinar uh, very concrete and exciting uh, uh, because uh, uh, we are closer to the demand for action uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of whatever enlightenment we can get from uh, this webinar. So I'm uh, happy I, uh, uh, I extend to you once more my warmest revolutionary greetings to you. All right, Tito. Mapulang pagbati din po. Tito, um, in most countries, September marks the commencement of the new academic year. Philippines' academic calendar is a little different. Though, before we start with this topic of Chikahan, can you tell us about your life as a student and university professor in the Philippines? I'm sure the young generation is eager to know how university life was like for you? Uh, I entered the University of the Philippines as freshman in 1956. And I was uh, uh, very happy to be in a public school again. I had my public school in the gr grades and um, uh, I had come uh, from uh, an exclusive Catholic school and so I had a uh, great sense of freedom uh, uh, in coming to a university with uh, about liberal principles. So uh, a non-sectarian institution famous for so many uh, learned men uh, 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 who, have, uh, who are alumni of the university. I rushed through the four-year AB course, the Bachelor of Arts course, and finish it in three years time because I had planned to take law. I had fun with schoolmates, including fellow campus writers and activists. Even if I took overloads of 24 or 27 units per semester and went to summer school twice. But when I finished my AB course in 1959, I needed a job immediately because I had gotten married to Judy. Thus, I accepted from the UP English Department the scholarship grant to take the master's course in comparative literature combined with teaching fellowship and the duty to teach uh, English. I did not yet have the rank of a professor when I taught English in the UP from 1959 to 1961. I was still at the bottom of the faculty. I became a professorial lecturer at the Lyceum of the Philippines in political science from 1964 to 1968. That's, that was the period when I came uh, across a fellow uh, named uh, Rodrigo Duterte. Mm -hmm. uh, when I stepped out of political detention in 1986, I became an associate professor at the UP Asian Center of Graduate Studies in 1986. Ito, ano, um, it might not be an exager exaggeration to say that Philippine education might be one of the most expensive. So one semester might cost you a minimum of 30,000 uh, pesos since the books, school supplies, projects, uniform, and daily allowance. Um, how come and why is the Philippine education very expensive in our country? Uh, Philippine education, especially at the university level, is expensive. 
because the reactionary government has reduced funding for the state colleges and universities. And the school administrations are compelled to raise tuition fees to pay the teachers and maintain operations. The Duterte regime channels most of the public funds to bureaucratic corruption and to overspending for the military and police. The private colleges and universities benefit from the state policy of promoting commercialized education or education for profit by school owners. They take advantage of the inadequacy and expensiveness of the state colleges and universities. And they have wide latitude in charging high tuition fees and other kinds of uh, school fees. The state policy of underfunding state colleges and universities and letting the private schools have their way in making profits is due to the fact that the foreign and domestic employers in the Philippines have limited needs for professionals and technical experts for then an underdeveloped pre-industrial and agrarian economy. Of course, the people have unlimited needs for educated people, no? but then uh, the ruling system does not uh, uh, make way for the educated or does not uh, re really systematically encourage those who are educated to serve the people. Thus, many of our people who finish the high school and college levels of education go jobless um, and are compelled uh, to seek jobs abroad uh, because, uh, uh, the, uh, under, because of the underdeveloped pre-industrial and agrarian uh, economic conditions. Tito, has the education system in the Philippines has always been like this? Or has it always been designed and has always been designed for the framework of neoliberalism? What was the education, the education system like during the pre-colonial times? Uh, you are correct in mentioning the framework of neoliberalism. This has aggravated the decline and deterioration of the Philippine educational system and the rising cost of getting an education. Neoliberalism promotes profit making by the capitalist in education and serving the limited needs of the foreign monopolies and the local exploiters for highly educated Filipinos. The neoliberal emphasis is on educating the students for local exploitation and for export of cheap labor. Since the adoption of the neoliberal economic policy four decades ago, the Philippine educational system has deteriorated. But of course, even in previous times, there were already limitations and encumbrances on the Philippine educational system because of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal character of Philippine society. The university level of education is mainly a privilege of the children of the exploiting classes and the upper middle class. In Spanish colonial times, when feudal conditions prevailed, catechism was the main form of education for the entire people. Only the children of the landlord class, merchants, professionals, and bureaucrats could go to Ateneo, Letran, and the University of Santo Tomas. It would only be under the U.S. colonial regime that the public educational system was established and private schools established to serve the expanded needs of a semi-feudal economy under modern imperialism. But let us not idealize and romanticize education in pre-colonial times. We had high literacy, uh, we had a high literacy level of supposedly 80%, much higher than that of Spain at the time. But we did not yet have a full system of primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of education. Uh, the children of the Datus and the wealthy families had also the privilege of being more and better tutored than others in the sultanates and other types of pre-colonial societies that existed in the Philippines. Tito, many migrant workers leave their home country to send their children to school, hoping to end the cycle of migration, but failing. There seems to be no end at the cycle of migrations for poor countries. How bad is the global economy for the students and families to decide to still leave their countries and try their luck somewhere else. It is a major global phenomenon that migrant workers come in big numbers 
from the underdeveloped countries to industrial capitalist countries and other developed economies. This has been undertaken by the imperialist powers to make up for the loss of colonies by bringing cheap labor to the metropolis from the underdeveloped uh, hinterlands. And under neoliberal economic policy, the phenomenon of labor migration has grown because of the poverty in the source countries and also because of, an, uh, of wars of aggression by the imperialist powers and because of the degradation of the environment by the multinational firms. As the global capitalist economy deteriorates, there will be more impoverished people wishing to get jobs abroad, even as the economic crisis worsens in the capitalist countries and generates anti-immigrant sentiments and movements among the reactionaries. By the way, do you wish to know the number of Filipino migrant workers before COVID-19? Yes, you know. uh, they are 12 million and they are 25% of the 48 million labor force of the Philippines. Another 10.6 million or more than 22% of the labor stay behind in the Philippines as unemployed. This is a huge reserve of cheap labor for Philippine and foreign employers. The number of unemployed has risen so drastically as a result of COVID-19. Ito now, there is a growing number of scholars coming from third world countries. Why do Western countries promote their school and import academics from third world countries? How does this affect the origin of uh, countries of scholars? Indeed, there has been a brain drain, a migration of scholars and professionals from the third world to the Western countries. They are excellent and are cheap to hire, and they desire to be employed because of less opportunities for higher income and professional advancement. The imperialist powers also have a special interest in using them to influence ideological and political currents in the Philippines, especially in the social sciences. There is a vicious cycle in the diaspora of scholars and professionals. The dire conditions in their own countries push them to go and stay abroad. As they leave the country, the people are deprived of their services, but I do not blame these migrant scholars and profession professionals. It is the duty of the revolutionary forces and people in the Philippines to make revolutionary change. And these migrant scholars and professionals will come home to help build a better and brighter uh, Philippines. The COVID-19 pandemic has become a polit political and economical crisis. Many have not returned to their jobs and yet many might not be able to return. Like any other global crisis, it is the poor who are us usually suffering. How is it going to affect the millions of youth uh, students? Yes, by itself, the COVID-19 pandemic has generated political and economic crisis. It has aggravated the earlier and continuing worsening political and economic crisis of the world capitalist system. Crisis conditions are becoming worse in both the capitalist and underdeveloped countries. The poor toiling masses of workers and peasants suffer most, and the youth and students are suffering worse conditions than ever before. The states provide the monopoly a capitalist class with the loan bailouts and stimulus packages and allow them to end employment contracts and obligations for the workers. The unemployed remain unemployed and get no sufficient unemployment relief. If the host uh, people suffer, the more our migrant Filipino workers are in a dire situation. Many of them have lost their jobs and need to return home. They can no longer remit uh, money to their children to allow them to go to school. Yes, Tito. Um, basically, the world leaders are trying to restore the normality of life from tourism, business, uh, as well as education. As an educator yourself, can we hear your opinion about this new normal? The biggest companies have taken advantage of the COVID-19 to retrench their workforce because the economy has in fact receded. And many of the medium and small enterprises, which employ a lot of people, have been devastated. Even when the COVID-19 pandemic recedes as a problem, the crisis of overproduction of the entire world capitalist system will become worse. The economies will continue to sink. 
because it cannot employ so many unemployed and thus the market for the products of industry will continue to shrink. The new normal will be even more abnormal than relatively better times in the past. <clears throat> the crisis will continue to worsen. Contradictions among imperialist powers, between imperialist powers and oppressed peoples and nations and between capital and labor will intensify. The imperialist and local reactionaries will unleash state terrorism and ultra-reactionary movements of xenophobes, uh, racist, misogynist, and fascist. The U.S. will continue its endless wars and will try to win its growing contradictions with China. At the same time, the proletariat and peoples of the world will continue to intensify the anti-imperialist and democratic struggles that became conspicuous last year. The crisis conditions make people suffer, but also drive them to fight back. Tito, um, many of the students, even in Western countries, are taking part-time jobs so to sustain their education. There are also parents of migrant children and whose jobs are most probably in the front lines. Cleaners, health workers, shopkeepers, and etc. If the labor market is worsening, why do they still need to insist on the resum resumption of the academic year? Indeed, a great number of students <clears throat> will not be able to go to school because they lose their part-time jobs or parents can no longer finance their studies. But it is important to make uh, demands even on imperialist and reactionary states to enable all the students to continue with their studies. If these states do not comply with the just and reasonable demands, then they are exposed for what they are and become easier targets for revolutionary resistance. In the meantime, there are still students with some families that can support their education. Let them continue to study and try to motivate them to join the movement for revolutionary change as much as possible. They can still uh, make significant contributions to the revolutionary movement of the youth and the entire people. Ito, what do you think about the postponement of academic year? Is there an alternative about this? In the Philippines, the public schools, including the state uh, colleges and universities, under the direction of the Department of Education, are supposed to start the new academic year in October because the COVID-19 pandemic has become worse in the Philippines. But certain private schools, especially at the secondary and tertiary levels, have already begun their academic year through online schooling. I think that even under current conditions, it is possible to have a mix of teachers meeting the students for the purpose of instruction and homework assignment at the primary level. The teachers and parents can cooperate to ensure that the homework is done. The teachers and the supervisors can be trusted with lesson plans and methods of teaching and using the school facilities like the classrooms, the school grounds and other facilities with due respect to social distancing, sanitation and hygiene. At the secondary and tertiary levels, or high school and college level, it is, uh, most, it is more feasible to have a mix of online schooling and classroom or laboratory meetings. Online schooling can be availed of as already done by certain private schools. It might be worthwhile to study and plan how to put into convenient groups those students who lived in the same areas and let those students with computer gadgets to share the gadgets with those who have none. Otherwise, the government must provide the computer gadgets. The problem is that Duterte and his fellow thieves have already bankrupted the government. Yes, Tito. But in the Philippines, the Department of Education is considering online schooling. It might work in foreign countries, um, for example, in ours, where internet is visible, but not in the Philippines. Why is not going why is it not going to work in the country or for the sake of the gov or argument how can we make it work as i have said certain private schools in the philippines at the secondary and tertiary levels have resorted to online schooling but these are schools of students from well-to-do families who can afford the computer gadgets the poor students who do not have these gadgets and cannot participate in online uh, uh, schooling. Probably it can work if the students who live in the same neighborhoods can be grouped with those 
who own the gadgets sharing these with classmates who have none, as I've earlier said. Yes. Tito, as Filipinos, we cannot discuss the educational system of the country without discussing the famous slogan of the youth and student, Pambansa Scientifico at Makamasang Edukasyon, nationalistic, scientific, and mass-oriented. What is it about and why is, that import, why is it important that our educational system should be patriotic, scientific, and pro-people? The line of patriotic, scientific, and pro-people education is important for defining the nature and purpose of the educational system. It guides and determines <coughs> the content <coughs> and methods of education. We need to carry out the line in order to overcome the dominant uh, or still strong anti-national influence of pro-colonial uh, and pro-imperialist ideas, feudal and medieval obscurantism, and the anti-people and selfish motivations and direction of those who think that they are superior to other people uh, just because of their higher uh, formal education. Education must be national or patriotic in character in order to uh, meet and satisfy the needs of the Filipino nation, cherish our own national cultural heritage and current achievements and overcome subservience uh, uh, to imperialist powers. Education must be scientific so that we can use science and technology that have been achieved by us as well as by others in the world in order to develop the country. Education must serve the entire Filipino people, especially the workers and peasants who are oppressed and exploited. It must serve the national struggle for uh, national and social liberation. Lastly, Tito. Can you tell us about the educational system envisioned by the revolutionary forces? We know it's included in the NDFP's 12-point program. The kind of educational system envisioned by the revolutionary forces in the NDFP program is patriotic, scientific, and pro-people in character and purpose, as likewise espoused by the legal democratic forces of the people. During the current stage of people's democratic revolution, the revolutionary forces welcome what good reforms can be realized by the legal democratic movement despite the tremendous odds. But in the guerrilla fronts in the countryside, the people's democratic government is striving to promote and advance the line of patriotic, scientific, and pro-people in a more extensive and intensive way. The current stage of the Philippine revolution has a socialist perspective and direction. The Filipino revolutionary forces and people ought to know, even now, that education shall be universally free at all levels of formal education. Of Upon the basic completion of the People's Democratic Revolution, through the seizure of political power, the socialist revolution shall begin and the realization of universal free education at all levels of education with a patriotic, scientific, and pro-people character shall also begin. We know from the history of other peoples the great achievements made by socialism in the field of education in order to develop a country by leaps and bounds economically, socially, politically, and culturally. All right. Tito, uh, thank you so much for being with us again no, for our episode of Chikahan. Um, again, to our audience, we have discussed the COVID-19 and its effects to the youth's education. Um, if you would love more of this Chikahan episodes with Tito Jo, as we discuss the burning hot topics uh, at the current uh, issues, um, just don't forget to like, share, and follow Anakbayan Europa and uh, subscribe to Tito Jo's channel, Joma Season. And if you want to join Anakbayan, it is really fun. Just me don't hesitate to message us. Ano. At ayon Tito, um, uh, again, this is the Chikahan uh, with Tito Jo. Tito Jo, uh, may gusto ko mong sabihin, lastly, before we end our episode today. Uh, I, again, I would like to thank uh, uh, you as host, uh, Kaangelo, and uh, our, all our listeners. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, the Chikahan will uh, go on. There will be no end to uh, important issues that we must uh, uh, take up. 
And yes, uh, of course. Uh, we always need to clarify to each other uh, what uh, um, is the correct position with regard to those issues and what can we do uh, in order to uh, act on those issues uh, while we are abroad and uh, also uh, while we would be eventually in the Philippines. I agree with you, Tito. Maraming salamat ulit, Tito Joe. Uh, to our viewers, don't forget to like, uh, share, and subscribe, and follow Anakbayan Europa for more of Chikahan. This is Chikahan with Tito Joe, COVID-19 and its effects on youth education. Mapagpala gabi po para sa ating lahat. Uh-huh.